Take your Bible, if you would, turn to John 12. Um, well, I tell you what, if the devil, if the devil was ever acting against a day, he's doing it now, I can tell you that. I sure can tell you that. Um, let's see here, where are my notes starting? There we go. I think I got it. John chapter 12, are you there? Say amen. I'm glad you, I'm glad somebody is. Uh, John chapter 12, uh, we're going to be focusing on verse 26, but I want to go back a little bit and uh, read into that. Before we do, let's please have a word of prayer. Amen. Father, we love you very much. We thank you, God, for this day. Father, we thank you that the rain that all oh, that rain looked pretty mean a while ago. And uh, Lord, we know, Father, that rain and lightning and thunder, that could have knocked us out for the night. You didn't let that happen. As far as we know, Lord, the Internet's still on. Computers are still working. The microphone's on. And Father, most importantly, the Bible's still right. And it's still good. And Father, I just, I just want to say thank you, God, for allowing us to come into your house tonight, get together. Father, well, there's a lot of us, we're tired. Our minds are racing to and fro because of all the things that we have already done, things we're probably still in the process of doing and thinking. And Father, the thing, the many things that we have yet to do. And Father, it's because of your kingdom and your glory and your name and your children, Father, that we do this. Lord, help us not complain. Help us not complain tonight, Father. Help us not complain in anything that we do uh, for this year's homecoming. Uh, because, Lord, the, the service of the Lord is nothing but the greatest honor that you could give anybody in this world. Is that, God, you give us a chance to serve you, a chance, a place in your kingdom. It's like David said, it wouldn't bother him if he was just the doorkeeper to the house of the Lord. Father, it wouldn't bother me tonight, Lord, if, if all you ever used me for for the rest of my life was just to stand there at the door, open the door for people when they came in, shake their hand, smile at them, tell them that we were glad to see them in God's house. Lord, that wouldn't bother me a bit. I just thank you, God, that you have given us a place to come together, to love one another, to pray for one another, to uplift one another. Lord, I'll be honest. God, I need people praying for me tonight and tomorrow and this weekend. So, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would just uh, continue to bless us tonight. We thank you, God, for good things that you have done. We thank you, Father, Lord, for the love that you've poured out to us. And even though, God, some, some of the things in the building aren't working right, even though, Father, with, there's little glitches here and there, our minds are tired, our bodies are tired, but, Father, Lord, our souls refresh coming into your house tonight. And Lord, we've had some good, good things happen this week. And I pray, dear God, that you would uh, Lord, that you would release me, at least in a way, Lord, to talk about some of the good things you've done uh, this week. Lord, I want it to be a blessing to people. I want, I want people to know, Father, that this church saved somebody's life this week. 
And I mean in a very, very real big way. Father, just bless and encourage us. Bless and encourage people online. Father, be with those that will be traveling. Uh, hopefully, Lord, to Bethel this weekend. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd give us a full house. Bless us, Lord, as we talk about awesome things out of your word. We love you. We thank you, God. Open our eyes and our ears to your word tonight and teach us some really good things that we need to hear, some things we need to listen to. And bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm not going to use names, um, but I am going to tell um, a story of some things that God has used, of one particular thing that God has used this church for, that I am, I'm just, I'm just going to be honest with you. I am very, very honored and blessed to be able to be part of something like this. If you remember back in June, it was the weekend of June the 4th, um, I came in here on a Sunday and I was very distressed, very distressed. Uh, several things had, had hit me that weekend that, I, I mean, I just, I was literally shaking. My wife will tell you, Alicia will tell you that for three days straight, I just, I literally was, I was shaking over what had happened. A, a young, I won't say a young child, but a young person in this church reached out to me on Saturday, I think that would have been June the 4th, if I'm right, through text message, and they said, Pastor Mike, will you pray for me? And I wasn't expecting that from this particular person. And so I noticed that they had contacted me the night before, but it was already after I'd gone to sleep. And... Um, What is it here? You want me to read? Okay. So it doesn't have anything to do with what I'm saying? Okay. All right. Anyway. Um, so anyway, I answered back. I knew who it was. And I, and I said, sure, I'll pray for you. What's the matter? And this young person responded to me that, Someone in their immediate family had been molesting them for the past five years. And when I read that note, I literally, we were still in our, we were still in our RV. I went, no, just like that. Nobody around, nobody heard me. That, that got me. So I composed myself, and let me tell you a little bit in case you don't know this. Ministers, pastors, Catholic priests, doesn't matter who you are, in this country we are mandatory reporters. And I've had... People come into my office and say, Pastor, i got something that's really, I, you know, I've got some sin in my life, I'm going to tell you about it. And before they ever say a word, I always tell them, if you say anything to me about hurting a child, I'm letting you know right now, as soon as you say it, I'm going to pick up the phone, I'm going to call the child abuse hotline, I am, or I will go to, I am not going to jail for anybody. And 
so I started trying to get, and it wasn't hard, to get as much information as I could about who the person was, what their name was, where'd they live. I didn't, I didn't ask, nor do I to this day want to know exactly what all happened, but I did say, how often has this been going on? And that person replied, um, about four or five years. I said, how often? And this person said, uh, every time that we are alone in the house together. I said, how often does that happen? And they said, every day. And I screamed again. And I asked, who have you told? This person informed me that they had told another family member who their response was, slap, you're a liar, I don't believe you, quit telling these lies. That infuriated me. So having the information that I needed, uh, I at first tried to call, they put you on hold, they tell you if you're a mandatory reporter to go online and fill out a report, and that is exactly what I did um, with the information that I had. Now the good news is, and I'm not kidding you, Within 15 minutes of me filing that report online, I got a phone call from an investigator who was in Festus. And I went, wow, that was quick. And they wanted to know where the young person was, where the alleged perpetrator was, are they together now? And, and I said no, and so on and so on. So they went right out, investigated it, not too long after that, a forensic investigator went out to investigate, and that's a person who talks to young people, knows how to get the truth out of them, knows whether or not they're telling the truth or a lie or not. So anyway, um, at least three investigators that I know of investigated this. It is now before the... Um, prosecutor's office and they are contemplating filing charges. One of the things that bothered me was usually in a case like this Division of Family Services gets immediately involved and in something this serious they usually will remove the child out of the home to make sure that the child is at least in a safe environment temporarily. Well, no one did that, and I was very upset. Also, usually a, a child will get their own lawyer, a guardian ad litem. That was not done either, and I'm very upset about that. So just to make a long story short, The child was in a safe place, but a family member was this close to taking that child and putting it back into the environment that they came from. And I'm going, that cannot happen. I recommended to, and it was someone who goes to this church, you need to call a lawyer first thing in the morning and find out what can be done. Can you get a protective order? Can you get temporary custody? What can happen? And so the next day, that person did that. They called me back, and they said, yes, they can do that, but it's going to cost about $2,800 for a retainer. I don't have that kind of money. I said, call the lawyer get them on the phone with me, I will give them our church credit card, we're going to pay for it. And we did. It went before a judge last week. The judge signed a temporary order saying that the child can remain in the house where that child is safe right now. 
But Friday or Monday is, of course, a trial. And, but all indications are that this child is going to remain safe for a long, long, long time. Yes. Um, I, and if you want to say, well, our church paid that. Listen, if we can spend $6,500 paying, pe buying people food in Kenya that we'll never meet in this world, it would be a sin to let one of our own be in harm's way and us not do anything about it. And if you want me to pay the bill, all you have to do is say so. But I figured I'll let y'all share the glory. Does that sound okay? All right. Feels good to save somebody's life, doesn't it? Feels good to save somebody's soul. Amen. John chapter 12, verse 26. The Bible, Jesus said, If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. Think about what he's saying here. Where Jesus goes, that's where you're going. Wherever he leads you, you should follow. And do you get a choice? If you say, no, Christ will grab you like, the, like my mom did or my teacher did. My fifth grade teacher set us out to the hallway to go get a drink of water and go to the bathroom. And he said, do not make any noise out of that hallway. And I, what did I do, Melissa? As soon as I cleared that door, I got my motorcycle going blum, blum, down the hallway just like that. And my teacher grabbed me by the arm. And literally ran me down to Mr. Moutre's office. That was his name, Moutre. And he was big and fat, so guess what we called him? Moo Cow, yeah. Anyway, I got paddling that day. Where Jesus is, that's where you're going. Amen. I am there, shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Listen, I want to be on the side of those who love whom Jesus loves and who protects whom Jesus protects. Somebody say amen. I do not want to be on the side of those who Jesus said, if any man will hurt one of these little ones, it would be like it'd be better for him to put a millstone around his neck, cast himself into the sea. Verse 27, Jesus said, now is my soul troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven. Listen to this now, saying, I have, glorif I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. What did he mean by that? Glorify my name. Prior to this, Jesus went up on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17 and his face was transfigured before his disciples as his son. And God from heaven said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. One of these days, Jesus is going to appear again. And I believe maybe God's going to say it to the whole world again. This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Verse 29. Then the people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. Now I want you to pay attention to this. Thunder is generally God's voice in the Bible. Uh, some said it thundered. Let me read to you some verses very quickly. Revelation 10, verse 3. This is um, the mighty angel that came down from heaven. And he's got a book in his right hand, open, his face shining like the sun. He's clothed with a cloud. He's, to me, it's got to be Jesus. And in verse 3, the Bible says, And cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. 
And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Now wouldn't you like to know what those seven thunders said? I would too. So I've had this theory all these years that if it was seven thunders, these were not the voices of an angel or seven angels. They were not the voices of men or the saints in heaven. If it sounded like thunder, whose voice was it? God's voice. Now, since God or since the angel or whatever, since the, the voice from heaven told John, don't write down what the seven thunders uttered. How will we ever know what the seven thunders uttered? How will we ever know that? Do you think we'll ever know it? If you think we'll know it, raise your hand. If you think it'll be revealed one of these days, raise your hand. So my second question is, if you think it's going to be revealed, tell me how you think it's going to be revealed. How, John? The Bible. All right, now, John, tell me where it is. He's working on it. Josiah, you got an answer? Huh? It, it's somebody, I, I'll get to her, because I know she knows the answer. Or at least, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll put a dollar down that she knows the answer. Okay? No, that's a 20. You ain't even getting a 20. Give her a 1. A 100? You give your, have your mom give her a 100. Anybody else want to take a guess? Where do you think those seven thunders, go ahead, Everett. Up from heaven. Up from heaven. Well, that's a good answer. Yes, Jaden. Huh? What? God? Well, we already know God said it. How will we know what they are? Oh, you raised your hand. Go ahead. You raised your hand. Sure you did. You did this. No? The Bible. Wait a minute. See, uh, he told John not to write them down. What do you think, Melissa? Huh? Hmm, interesting. Yes, Josiah. Yeah. Here's what I believe. That's okay. You, that's how you're supposed to do it. Look it up. Seek ye the book of the Lord and read it. I believe they're already written down in the Bible. I just don't believe that John ever wrote them. John wrote John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation. He wrote five books out of the Bible. And I think the seven thunders and what they said are written for us in the scriptures, but John did not write them. Others did. That's what I think is going to happen. I think God's going to direct us to them one of these days and we'll know what they are. All right? That's all right. Now, well, let's move right along here. Turn to Exodus 19. Let me read it to you very fast if you want to turn there very fast. Exodus 19, verse 16, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. So I believe that the seven thunders and what they uttered, remember how he was told, John was told, write not the things and seal them up. Well, when the book then is unsealed, I think then the seven thunders' voices will be known. 
Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the nether part of the mountain and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace and the whole mount quaked greatly and when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder Moses spake and God answered him by a voice and the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses up to the top of, of the mount and Moses went up. Moses going up, it's a picture of Christ, like going up into heaven. But here God comes down, he descends on Mount Sinai, and when he comes, there are thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud. The Lord cometh in the cloud, the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. Those are the tr seven trumpets that are going to sound, and so on and so on. And it's the gathering together of God's people. And that's when I believe the seven thunders are going to be known what they are. Exodus 20 verse 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and all the light and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not, let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off. Moses drew near under the thick, thick darkness where God was. So this is after God has already read the Ten Commandments to the people. And as the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings, the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking and so on and so on. Let, and, but the people said, let not God speak with us lest we die. So at that point, Moses becomes the mediator for those people. But I believe there's coming a day when Christ, who is God, will speak to the Jewish people. Second Samuel 22, 14, the Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered His voice. That's where I get that. I studied this. I'm going, I'm going to find those seven thunders. That was back in my cocky, arrogant days. Back when I thought I could find just about anything. And I went looking for the seven thunders. But I don't believe I know what they are. But I do believe they are the voice of God. And if it's the voice of God, then I believe it's written in the word of God. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered His voice. Job 26, 14. Lo, these are parts of His ways, but how little a portion is heard of Him. But the thunder of His power, who can understand? Job 37, 4, after it a voice roareth, he thundereth with the voice of his excellency, and he will not stay them when his voice is heard. Now, I've not made it any big mystery. Back years ago, I used to love thunderstorms. I used to love to watch lightning. When I was out in Oklahoma and you had that flat land, I'd watch them big thunderheads boil up, and you could just sit and watch lightning in them for hours and hours and watch the wind move in there and my wife will tell you that when I see lightning and knowing that thunder is on the way I usually start trying to duck for cover I don't like it anymore but I believe that when God thunders his voice in my direction I don't believe I'm going to be afraid of it anymore and I, listen, that's worth the price of salvation to me right there. Job 37, 5, God thundereth, with, thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he which we cannot comprehend. Psalm 18, 13, the Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Psalm 29, 3, the voice of the Lord is upon many waters. The God of glory thundereth, the Lord is upon many waters. Psalm 29, 3, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. God, the God of glory, thundereth. The Lord has already read that. Psalm 77, 18, the voice of the Lord was in the heaven. The lightnings lightened the world, and the earth trembled and shook. Psalm 104, verse 7, at thy rebuke they fled, and at the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. Isaiah 29, 6, thou shalt be, thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts, with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest 
and the flame of devouring fire. If you look at Isaiah 29, 6, those are the very things that God descended down from heaven with to Mount Sinai. And when the Israelites heard it, saw it, what did they do? They ran in fear. That's because those people's hearts were so far removed away from God, they could not handle the presence of God. I believe saved people, God can lightning and thunder and shake the ground and shake the air and send the flames of devouring fire, and I think God's people will draw to it, not run away from it. Mark 3, 17, notice this, James the son of Zebedee, John the brother of James, Jesus gave them their last name. What was their last name? James and John Boanerges. Energy is where we get the word energy. Sons of of thunder do what yeah this is the th they ought to should they should have went wrestling after that tag team wrestling it's the thunder brothers amen um john look back at john chapter 12 now and i'm going to close out here in a minute um verse 30 John chapter 12. So we know that that thunder is the voice of God. Jesus, uh, verse 29, the people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. What is he referring to? He's referring to when Satan is cast into the bottomless pit. In verse 32, if you don't have this verse underlined in your Bible, underline it. And I, now watch this. He's tying the two things together. Number one, the casting of Satan into the bottomless pit. Now is the prince of this world uh, cast out. Verse 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. There's a church in Hillsborough right now that is in a big building program. Now, I don't know that church. I don't know anything about them. Maybe they're building on because they're church building isn't big enough to accommodate what they have now that's praise the lord that's good but maybe they're just building something new to show off because one of the things that i studied for years was the plan and the operations of what was called the church growth movement and i had a lady call here this had been years ago and she was saying that there was things in her church that she wasn't happy with. And I said, well, explain yourself. She said, well, the pastor is talking about getting rid of the pews and go, bringing in chairs. And I said, well, okay, that's not necessarily a sin. But, but I knew where she was going. And she said, well, then once they get rid of the pews, they're going to get rid of the hymn books and all the things are going to be up on the screen. I said, well, I, okay, I, I, I recognize this pattern already. And I said, let me finish this for you. I said, the next thing he's going to do is going to talk about how that the people in that community don't really want to go to a church building, but they don't mind getting into some sort of multi-purpose uh, building. So why don't we build this, why don't we forsake this building or tear it down or over here on the side lot build us this great big multi-purpose building it'll be a gymnasium it'll be a volleyball court it'll be all kinds of things racquetball tennis ball you name it we'll do all kinds of things in there 
Sunday morning we'll set chairs down and we'll have church in there and then we'll have this big and what we need now is we need 12.8 million dollars and we know the church doesn't have that so we're going to go into debt and I and I told her that and she said that's exactly what he's talking about I said does your church have 12.8 million dollars she said no he said we're going to have to borrow it and I said he's doing that and he's going to put your church's name on it and it's your church. How long have you been going to that church? She said, my family's been going to this church for years. I said, once they get into debt, you won't be able to leave because you and the rest of the people of that church will owe that debt. And he's going to lock you into that thing. Then they're going to talk about how they're going to start going with different Bibles. She said, he's already talking about that. I said, then he's going to start talking about different forms of prayer, like like meditation prayer and whispering prayer. She said, he preached on that last Sunday. I said, get out of that church. Get out of that church. Lead that church now while you still have a chance and while you still have a, while you still have a soul because they were going to tie these people down into that kind of bondage. They were going to walk away from the Lord and the last thing in the world they were going to do was lift up Christ and she said, they've already taken the crosses down out of the building. Because they said, that offends some people. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw them in unto me. Jesus said unto them, yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Haven't I told you many, many times, that while things are good in your walk with the Lord, spend some time with the Lord, talk to Him and say, God, it's not always going to be daylight, is it? God, when it gets dark, and while I'm doing good now, don't ever let go of my hand or I'll be lost. And he said, walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have light, believe in the light, that you may be children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. Uh, let me read a couple more verses here. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Turn to Isaiah 53, and then we'll have our prayer time. Isaiah 53. So, oh, let's see here. Josiah. Let's say that, let's say that, uh, oh, a few weeks ago, and they had all that rain up in St. Louis. We didn't get it down here, but apparently it got bad up in St. Louis. Let's say that you were driving your car up there, and you were going through a neighborhood, and you didn't think the water was that deep, and all of a sudden you got in it, and now the water is almost over the top of your car. And you're in danger. And you cry to the Lord for help. And lo and behold, out of the blue, the wind starts blowing. And it blows the water on both sides of your car and opens up a way. Right? A dry roadway for your car to get out of that wouldn't that be cool? Would you ever forget that? No. Wouldn't that just make you serve God forever? Huh? You know, that's an interesting way you put that. Because the truth of it is, God did exactly that for Israel. And they saw it, I see you. And they never forgot that, and yet, did they serve God every day after that? No. 
they walked away. In fact, it didn't take them long. Once they got to the other side of the Red Sea and they get over there to Mount Sinai, all of a sudden now they're complaining for water. And they're complaining so much that God is so mad at them, he's about ready to kill every one of them. The wow part of that miracle lasted all of a few days. And how often did Israel complain while they were in the wilderness? Just about every day. See, God hasn't blown down from heaven and split water for you so you could cross a big channel of water in the middle of the road and keep you safe. All he's done for Josiah is have Moses write it down in a book. So we're actually one up on the Israelites in Moses' day. And I'll tell you why. We haven't seen these miracles with our eyes. We only read them in a book. A book that everybody you talk to would tell you, well, men wrote that book. It's full of fables. And yet, your whole salvation is based on whether or not you actually believe what's in that book. Miracles that happened three or 4,000 years ago. And some would say, well, what does that matter? It matters because God is the one who inspired it and had it written. And God said, if you'll believe what I say, I'll save you. But if you don't believe what I say, trust me, even if I did it in front of your very eyes, it wouldn't save you either. Because I tried that and it didn't work. All God asks you to do is believe the book. And then you're saved. The problem is, we're now having a hard time finding people who will even read the book, much less believe it. What a world this is, amen? What a wicked world this is. And I'll just say to you, and we'll pray. I had told you a few weeks ago about what we went through in one particular situation in dealing with Caleb. God had taught me to trust him. And I've been spending the last going on um, two months now encouraging a young person in this church who was in fear of their very life to trust God. And had I not been through the things that I've been through, I'm not sure that I would have even had the confidence to be able to tell this young person, you can trust God. But I did, and this young person saw the handiwork of God save that person's life. I'm glad God's still doing it. I am.